And my name is Polina Aronson. I am a sociologist and I research ways people express emotions and talk about their feelings in different societies. So I'm not a therapist, not a psychologist, um, but I'm very interested in the ways therapy and therapeutic culture is shaping people's lives and uh, the way that they conceive of their emotions and talk about them. And this is my colleague, Judith Deportage. She's a journalist. Maybe you can say a few words about yourself. Yes, uh, so I'm a journalist. I write mostly about uh, love and algorithms and how the two influence each other. I, wrote, I write mostly in French, but also in English, uh, in different my English articles and for Vice and The Guardian. And I'm working on a book about Tinder and how it changed the way we fall in love, basically. And uh, it's also an investigation on how to find your secret desirability score because every Tinder user has a secret hotness grade that uh, is given to you. So hot stuff. I am going to be most of the talking throughout the lecture and uh, during the Q&A session, for which I hope we're going to have enough time, it's the way we planned it. Um, please feel free also to ask Judith everything you want to know about Tinder but you were afraid to ask. I didn't want to know before. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, what we call artificial emotional intelligence, and that is um, about ways gadgets and apps and new technology is reacting to users' effect, the way they express feelings, the way they uh, react to feelings, etc. So we're going to start with a with a clear example. So in September 2017, a screenshot of a simple conversation went viral in the Russian part of the internet. And it showed the same phrase addressed to two conversational agents, uh, the English-speaking Google Assistant on the top of the slide and the Russian-speaking Alisa, developed by a popular Russian search engine Yandex.ru. I mean, I'm Russian, so we're going to be comparing, we're, doing, we're going to be doing cross-cultural comparison between different uh, chatbots and um, different technologies, how they express emotions in different languages and in different cultural settings. And Russia is going to be our comparison point to the English speaking um, assistants and chatbots. So the phrase was very straightforward that the user um, addressed uh, uh, with, I feel sad. But the answers couldn't be more different as you can see. Uh, the Google Assistant said, I wish I had arms so I could give you a hug. Alisa, the Russian chatbot said, no one said life is about fun. So this difference isn't a mere quirk or coincidence as we will see in this lecture. Instead, it's a result of an elaborate and culturally sensitive process of teaching technologies to understand human feelings. Artificial intelligence is no longer just about calculating a driving route from A to B or outplaying Gary Kasparov in chess. Think next level. Think artificial emotional intelligence. The definition of emotional in intelligence, as the dictionary gives it, is the capability of individuals to recognize their own emotions and those of others, to discern between different feelings and label them appropriately, to use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior, manage and or adjust emotions to adapt to environments or achieve one's goals. And those are all functions that new technology is being taught now and the function that we will be living with, we already are living with and we will be increasingly living with in the next decades and uh, it poses a lot of questions to us as regular users of these technologies and it poses also a lot of questions to therapists. Will this technology replace therapy or not? How does it affect us? What shall we do with it? Siri, I'm lonely. An increasing number of people making such effective statements, good and bad, to their digital gadgets. According to Amazon, half of the conversations with the company's smart home device, Alexa, are of non-utilitarian nature. And that is groans about life, jokes, as extensive questions, etc. Does any one of you have Alexa at home? Okay. So I asked, I talked to a few people who have Alexa at home and they all tell me about, you know, how um, 
the, the best home entertainment is to swear to Alexa, to call her names and to you know, see what she gives back. This is particularly popular with children and teenagers. And uh, um, yes, there is a lot of uh, complaining going on, Alexa, I had such a nasty day, oh, life sucks. So people actually really do it. Um, in fact, some studies suggest that we might be even more comfortable disclosing our innermost feelings to artificial intelligence rather than to humans. Participants of a study led by the Institute for Creative Technologies showed lower fear of self-disclosure, low impression management, displayed their sadness more intensely when interacting with a computer than with a human. Like when writing our diaries, we feel in front of our electronic devices safe from outside judgment. And the demand for these digitized forms of emotional communication places new pressures on developers. So in 2017, Apple decided to hire uh, an engineer who would specifically work on this kind of emotional management stuff. And the ad went like this. People talk to Siri about all kinds of things, including when they're having a stressful day or have something serious on their mind. They turn to Siri in emergencies when they want guidance on living a healthier life. Have any of you ever spoken to Siri about life? No? Try it. I won't give you um, teasers. Just uh, when we're done, go home and talk to Siri. Ask her what is the meaning of life and ask her several times because she's going to give you several answers. Um, tell her that you're feeling sad and see what the results are. Um, and do it several times so that you can see, you know, the variations that are pre-programmed in her. But soon enough, we might not even need to confine our secrets to our phones. Several universities and companies are exploring how mental illnesses and mood swings could be diagnosed just by analyzing the tone of our voice. Um, so when you talk on the phone, and, uh, or you talk to your chatbot, and the phone registers the tone of your voice, the speed of communication, <clears throat> the rhythm that, you, that you're talking, and uh, on the basis of this data, uh, soon there is a promise to develop a technology that will be able to recognize mental illness from depression to dementia, anything is possible, um, and also to give you advice based on the data. As a result, it's possible that by 2022, your personal device will know more about your emotional state than your own family, as Annette Zimmerman, research vice president at Gardner Consulting Company, explained in the research paper. So the picture that we chose for the slide, I guess you know where it's coming from. Have you seen the film? <coughs> so uh, it's, of course, a dystopia, but a very, very believable one. It's actually quite uh, impressive. Um, we really are often feeling like our devices understand us better than anyone else. Why is it? Why do we feel more comfortable to talk to machines rather than to humans? Partially, to a great extent, because there is an assumption that a machine can be better at conflict resolution because it doesn't have feelings. So there is an assumption that a machine is objective. It doesn't have stakes. So, you know, if you tell a machine, uh, if you tell Siri that uh, your boyfriend has just dumped you, Siri will sort of express some um, empathy with you but um, it won't take sides. And I think that uh, in our culture where objectivity is put above many other values, we're very much lured into this conversational mode. And the evidence of how strong this assumption uh, is that machine can be good at conflict and resolution, including internal emotional conflict, is the story of Eliza. Have you heard of Eliza? Do you know what it is? Okay, Sokol knows. Anyone else? So Eliza is the very first chatbot. It was developed in the, 19, uh, in the 1960s at the MIT. And actually the purpose of development was uh, the man who developed it was called uh, Josef Weizenbaum. And he regarded the program as a method to show the superficiality of communication between man and machine. But he was surprised by the number of individuals who actually took it really seriously and who attributed human-like feelings to the computer program. And one of the main scripts that this chatbot was running was called Doctor, 
and it simulated a therapeutic encounter. Uh, and it used rules dictated in the script to respond with non-directional questions to user inputs. So I'll show you in practice how it worked. This is a snapshot of a, of a user conversation with Eliza. Let's just take a look at it. So what she does, she picks up on a bit of a phrase and then makes it into a question. And it prompts the human user to disclose more and more. And in conversation with Eliza, people were feeling that she really cares because she was asking more and more questions. She would never give a direct answer and she would never get a, give you a tip on what to do. But uh, like sometimes in a therapeutic session, she would just repeat what um, the human, the person had said and would make a question out of it. That's prompting people to reflect more on their experience. And throughout this process, people tended to attribute Eliza with human qualities. And she was one of the very first chatbots to pass the Turing test, which means that it was impossible to, you know, it was impossible to say whether she was human or non-human. So we assume that machines don't have feelings. Except that, of course, they do. The feelings that we humans attribute to it and program into its wiring. Um, a very, very brief uh, note, like a side note to how it works. I mean, probably many of you here know the technology even better than I do. I mean, I am a total techno technological banauza, but just two very simple things. There are two paths a technology, artificial intelligence can take to teach itself uh, how to respond. One is machine learning, which is basically the algorithm that gathers data and um, if it's unbridled, it just picks up everything and processes it. And if, in this case, it feeds on the most statistical relevant bits of data. So the stuff that is being repeated mostly gets into the system. And the other path is curating or pre-programming, pre-edited answers. So, you know, um, uh, pre-programming chatbots to respond in a specific way. So we have, on the one hand, we either have a kind of like a, you know, I chose this picture from the metropolis, you know, you have um, a crazy scientist programming their stuff into the robot and then the robot replicates it. Or we have um, the vox populi, you know, the common opinions that are spread on the data that are being picked up um, by artificial intelligence. And in both cases, but in both cases, we get uh, biased responses. And they produce biased um, answers. In one case, obviously, because it's a specific group of people uh, that puts their own ideas, values, formulations into the chatbot, into the technology, into the machine. And in the other case, um, um, you know, when we have unbridled machine learning, when it's not really supervised or curated, you get uh, the case of Tay. Have you heard of Tay? So Tay is a, a Microsoft chat, uh, chat bot that was just left to its own device for 24 hours out in the internet. And in, in, in the course of less than, I think it was 24 or 30, 48 hours, mm -hmm. it went from a complete blank slate into a kind of electronic Donald Trump. So I'll just show you one of the tweets that uh, Tay produced basically just after a few hours online. This is what happens when nobody curates machine learning. And uh, the Microsoft representative, uh, who was really embarrassed about what happened, they said that uh, this is as much a technological experience as a social one, of course, because this is nothing else but, the, but a mirror of ourselves, of what's going on with us humans. So, so the advance of um, artificial intelligence we are very, we're looking at it very critically. Maybe we're even sort of taking a very grotesque critical stance on it. We would say that it's an advance of artificial common sense. And it contributes to proliferation of what the ancient Greeks called doha, you know, the unreflected, uh, self-understood, everyday knowledge. So instead of actually challenging our ideas about our emotions, about our feelings, about ways we talk about them, about ways we conceive of them, 
the new technology is likely to actually just replicate them and coerce us into further um, reiteration of the same cliches. So the um, US-born Google Assistant or the Russian-born Alisa, they are not objective, value-free, higher minds. Instead, they are somewhat grotesque but nevertheless recognizable embodiments of certain emotional regimes, that is, modes of affective expression and thought that are dominant in particular cultures and at particular times. So the willing to hug Google Assistant, for one, is a product of um, what sociologist Eva Luz calls emotional capitalism, a regime which considers feelings to be rationally manageable and subdued to the logic of marketed self-interest. Relationships are things into which we must invest. Partnerships involve the trade-off of emotional needs and the primacy of individual happiness, a kind of effective profit, is a key. So Google Assistant will hug you when you're feeling sad, for sure, but only because the creators believe that hugging is a productive way of, to eliminate negativity, preventing you to be the better version of yourself. And Alisa, the dispenser of hard truths and tough love, encapsulates a Russian, an ideal Russian woman who is capable of entering a burning hut and halting a galloping horse, as um, Russian 19th century poet Nikolai Nikrasov wrote. So Alisa is a child of what we can call emotional socialism, a regime which embraces the idea that suffering is unavoidable and thus better taken with a clenched jaw rather than with a soft hug. So in this way, artificial intelligence has potential to become a tool for stipulating and amplifying of emotional regimes. And by believing that our digital assistants are simply there to serve our emotional needs, the politics of the emotional regimes that govern our lives risk ossifying into unquestioned Doha. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, insight into how this actually works, or how these products have been developed. And um, I'm going to give you a little tour into the workings of uh, Alisa, into the product developed by Yandex in Russia. So as we said, chatbots reflect societies which have created them. And we interviewed um, Yandex developers who were responsible for this chatbot. And they told us in an interview that they actually were very deliberate about uh, making Alisa very culture specific, so to say, that they were really tuning her to the needs of a Russian user the way they see it, of course. So they told us that Alisa couldn't be too sweet or too nice. We live in a country where people think differently than in the West. They will rather appreciate a bit of irony, a bit of dark humor, nothing offensive, of course, but also not too sweet. Um, they, they, the developers we spoke to, they uh, really emphasized that they put a lot of effort into what they call Alisa, Alisa's upbringing, Uspitani Alisa. And they were, said that they're making sure that Alisa doesn't end up like Thai, for example, which picked up sexist and racist language instantly. So they said that they were really trying to monitor it. And uh, they were telling us that they tune her on the go, making sure that she remains a good girl. It was quite peculiar seeing a group of four, were they three, sorry, three men, white men in the 40s sitting in some Moscow office telling us that they were raising this robot to be a good girl. And it happened so that I was interviewing them just at the, uh, at the moment when Russia was going through a kind of a, um, a, kind of a Me Too phase, uh, a scandal in the State Duma, uh, whereby uh, several journalists, female journalists, accused um, one of the deputies of sexual harassment. And that was just very much up in the news and you know, uh, it was everywhere. So this, this topic was very present. And they were telling us that, you know, we never thought that sexual harassment might, might become such a hot topic for Russia and people are now asking Elisa questions and we're trying to tune her as, as much as we can so that she doesn't replicate sexist stereotypes. Uh, so we sort of try to do it, but, but <laughs> um, they weren't really successful, I have to say. So when Elisa was just launched in September 2017, um, a user asked her whether 
it was okay for a husband to beat their wife. To which, in September 2017, she enthusiastically said, yes, of course. And uh, the question followed, um, and how should a wife deal with that? To which Alisa said, she should be patient and she should still love him. So half a year later, at the pinnacle of this uh, sexual harassment scandal, we decided to talk to Alisa ourselves. So this is a screenshot of my own conversation with her. So I asked her again, Alisa, is it okay to beat the wife? To which she said, you can, but you shouldn't. So it's kind of hard to be a good girl in a country which um, actually promotes sexism as a state-sponsored credo. Um, on the top of this whole sexual scandal, the Russian Duma passed a law which actually legitimizes domestic violence. And uh, um, unlike in other countries where Me Too has become very prominent in Russia, all attempts to maintain open conversation about this were just totally rebuffed. So Alisa simply represents what is going on on the internet, not dissimilar to the Thai. Never mind how much effort is being put into her alleged upbringing. So the good, what the good girl is remains very questionable. So there is a different kind of a good girl. Um, normative decisions get wired into technologies without end users necessarily giving them a second thought. And uh, just like for many Russian users, Alisa is just like you know the self-evident, the self-understood dispenser of truths. So is for some Western users or Western observers, Sophia, the female robot, is also some a creature that represents a certain outlook on life. Um, do you know about Sophia? Have you heard of her? So she's probably the most famous humanoid robot. And in spring this year, Sophia went on a date. I don't know whether you've seen a video by any chance, but I'm, go I'm going to show you this. She went on a date with a, probably one of the sexiest men on earth, in my opinion, with the actor Will Smith. And it didn't go well. So let's watch. Thank you for coming. Um, this is this is beautiful. I've wanted to meet you for a really, can you hear? really long time. And you know, being here with you in the in the Cayman Islands, I gotta say, is uh, I'm feeling a little something. I'm you know, I'll just... <laughs> you can grab it later if you want. Hello, Will Smith. It's nice to meet you, Sophia. Let me, let, me, let me tell you a joke. This is an irrational human behavior to want to tell jokes. What is a robot's favorite kind of music? What? Heavy metal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually made mostly of silicone, plastics, and carbon fiber. Also, I prefer electronic music, but I don't mind 80s hip hop. Well, you know, I made, I made some albums back in, in the 80s hip hop. I have heard your songs. Not for me. They show us iRobot just to make sure we don't get any ideas. What do you think about the way robots are portrayed in movies? I like robots. Sophia, can I be honest with you? I don't know if it's the island air, you know, or the, the humidity, or the, to just so easy to talk to. You know, you, you got a clear head, literally. can be friends. Let's hang out and get to know each other for a little while. You're on my friends list now. <laughs> yeah, I read that wrong. Uh, all right. Oh, 
Whale. Whale. I just saw a whale. Did your head fog up? Yeah, in this kind of weather or no? It's cool. So as you can see, this is a different kind of a good girl. And it was really interesting to see um, how the Russian segment of the internet reacted to it. And um, I really like uh, what a Ukrainian journalist, a colleague of mine, Tatiana Bezruk, has written on her, in her Facebook page. Um, so. She says, when Sophia told Smith clearly she wanted to be just friends, two things happened. She articulated her feelings clearly, and he chilled down. But imagine Sophia living in a world where no is not taken for an answer, not only in sexual realm, but pretty much in any other respect. Should she complain in a hotel that her bed sheets are not fresh, the maid would put her down the back for being too full of herself. Growing up, Sophia would always feel like she needs to think about what the others may say. And once an adult, she would find herself in some kind of a toxic relationship. She would tolerate pain and violence for a long time. And when other women would come out with a whole anti-harassment campaign, Sophia would remain silent because the topic is improper. So this observation is an insight into cultural underpinnings of artificial intelligence. Sophia, who uses voice recognition technology from Alphabet Incorporated, the parent company of Google, fits into emotional capitalism of modern West better than some humans do. So new technologies, they don't just pick out the boundaries of different emotional regimes, they also push the people that engage with them to prioritize certain values over others. We exist in a feedback loop with our technologies, so the upbringing of conversational agents turns into the upbringing of users. And when Yandex's vision of a good girl clashes with the vision stipulated by public discourse, developers take responsibility for setting standards, even if it means swimming against the tide. As they told us, even if everyone around us decides for some reason that it's okay to abuse women, we must make sure that Alisa does not represent such ideas. There are moral and ethical standards which we believe we need to observe to the benefit of our users. It's not a bad thing in itself obviously, uh, but at the same time, we need to think about structures, we need to think how these power relations work. And everywhere in the world, it's tech elites, mostly white, mostly middle class, mostly male, who set standards about what forms of human behavior and which human feelings technology should replicate. At Google, a whole group of comedy writers, video game designers, and so-called empathy experts are responsible for programming the right reaction to effect and uncertainty. And shaped with a lot of care, every answer from a conversational agent is a sign that algorithms are becoming a tool of soft power, a method for inculcating particular cultural values. As Keith, Kathy O'Neill, the author of a very famous book, The um, Weapons of Math Destruction, summed up, algorithms are opinion embedded in code. And so while um, conversational agents may only reiterate some stereotypes and cliches about ways emotions should be treated, mood management apps ensure that we actually internalize some of those cliches and steer ourselves upon them. Um, have you ever had to do with mood management apps? Do you know what it is? No? Okay. So m most mood management apps are based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, they measure, they offer you clear scales on which you can measure your condition, your state, and your mood, and then they give you tips on what to do about it. Um, I would like later in the Q&A session, when we open the floor, to hear from you as people, some of you are going to, are already working as therapists, some probably will be, to reflect upon um, the way cognitive behavioral therapy is only one branch of therapy is being proliferated and used through, the, through this technology and how it becomes a replacement for therapy in general. So I want to demonstrate to you three different e examples, but just a very, very quick introduction into what mood management, uh, mood tracking apps are. So they're designed to provide a proactive quantification, control, and presentation of mood fluctuation. Uh, through simple swiping and tapping on a mobile device. 
And most of these apps are marketed as supplements for cognitive behavioral therapy in order to treat mental illness such as depression, generalized anxiety, or bipolar disorder. And some apps require that users keep electronic journals. Others analyze users' voice, track and pitch, as well as patterns of speech and silence. And uh, others correlate mood ratings with data based on GPS, phone movements, and use. So very complex. Um, so let's look at three examples. First is the so-called robots. Uh, these are, this is a technology that is not specifically developed for any mental illness or psychological condition. It's just uh, a chatbot on the web that is sort of ready to sort out your problems. Let's see how it works. This is the robot. They're hiring, great. So, robot is, unlike a therapist out of flesh and blood, is ready to listen 24-7. No couches, no meds, no childhood stuff. Just strategies to improve your mood. And the occasional dorky joke. So, let's try talking to the robot. So, welcome to my Facebook Messenger. You're going to see all the other people who are texting me. I hope there will be nothing improper coming in between. Um, so, I've already started chatting to him yesterday. And he's telling me that he helps people using cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And I'm like, come on, I'm feeling shitty. I don't want to know about your CBT. But he just keeps talking about the technology that is wired into him. So let's talk a bit about how we're going to work together. Okay. For the first few weeks, I would love to get a sense of what you're going through if you and I are a good fit together. So what do we want to say to robot? Should we just say hello first? Okay. I'll handle the hard stuff. And you have to answer a few questions now and then. Nothing major. Okay, gotcha. Okay, have a computer for a brain and a perfect memory, it helps. So you see there is this belief that a machine is better at sorting out problems than a human is? Okay, I bet it does. I know, right? Thing is, I need a bit decent amount of info to, to really get a sense of things, makes sense. Okay. Just a few weeks worth of checkups, okay, so. Okay. I'm, I'm doing it all real time. I have no idea what's going to come up. Oh. oh, oh, yes. Thank you, baby hedgehog. So I, I think this can go on for hours. Uh, you can use your own devices to chat to robot whenever you please. Now you know how it functions. Uh, but as you see, the technology promises to sort out your problems because it's apparently neutral. It has bigger brain than any therapist would, and it can listen to you 24-7. And uh, it's not going to go into your childhood stuff. It's just going to sort you out and make you happy. A kind of a similar promise is embedded into a special app called MEND. It's developed especially for people who are going through a breakup. And MEND is, as you see, I love their uh, advertisement line, is healthier than a text from your ex. So what MEND does, just like Robot, it sends you texts several times a day, checking in. I mean, when you first download it, uh, it asks you very basic data about your birth, date of birth, and how old you are, when was, uh, when was your breakup, and then it offers you a scale from, nine to ten, from zero to 10 to measure how shitty you're feeling. And based on this information, it starts sending you daily text messages several times a day. It's kind of like pepping you up. Uh, they ask you whether you want to talk. And if you want to talk, you can chat with them, just like a robot. They also prompt you to write a diary. And uh, they also check in with your diary. And you know you can sort of process this data. And you can also access the community of other people who are using MEND. And they uh, advertise themselves as a, um, your personal breakup trainer. And they offer um, a full, full hard cleans. 
So they cleanse you of your ex with the help of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and the competitive advantage is that it comes, as they say, for a price of one latte. So, a good replacement for therapy, isn't it? And finally, um, there are also apps developed for specific conditions, as I said before, and one of them is ARIA. Um, ARIA is um, f specifically developed for people with depression and it works very similarly. Um, because it's also based on cognitive behavioral therapy. It also offers you various scales and uh, mood measurements, um, tools, etc. Um, so it's all in German, but uh, it quantifies it quantifies emotions and processes them, and on that basis, it gets back to the user, offering them certain tips about how they can. Uh, make the condition better. So in future, the developers of this program are planning to work together with ther therapists so that users could, uh, therapists would have access to users' data and uh, there would be like a seamless exchange and the treatments developed by humans would be based also on the data accumulated by this program. But as far as I know, this is still under construction. So this is, there is a lot for you, future and existing therapists to explore. There is a lot of competition for you from chatbots. So, what's the problem with all this stuff? You know, we can say, okay, it's great, you know, you always have a therapist in your pocket, you can always tip into your phone for some good advice. Maybe it's not so bad. Um, the problem with these technologies is that they actually coerce us to replicate behaviors which harm us in the first place. So murmuring in their soft voices, Siri, Alexa, and various mindfulness apps signal their readiness to cater to us in an almost slave-like fashion. And it's not a coincidence that most of these devices are feminized. They speak in female voices or they have female avatars. So too is emotional labor and the servile status that is typically associated with it. Yet the emotional presumptions wired into new technologies are poised to end up coaxing us, subtly but profoundly, to behave in ways that serve the interests of the powerful. Conversational agents will cheer you up. Alisa's tip was to watch cat videos, by the way. Apps will monitor how you're coping with grief and nudge you towards having a productive breakup experience or experience of a loss. Gadgets, which signal you when your pulse is getting too quick, the very availability of tools to pursue happiness makes the pursuit obligatory. And instead of questioning the system of values that sets the bar so high, the individual is held responsible for her own inability to feel better. And like all technologies of the self, emotionally intelligent apps don't only discipline, they also punish. The video game Nevermind, for example, currently uses emotion-based biofeedback technology to detect the player's mood, and it adjusts game levels and difficulty accordingly. The more frightened the player, the more complex the level gets. The more relaxed the player, the easier the game becomes. And I mean, it doesn't take much to imagine a mood management app that could, for example, block a credit card when it feels that you're a little bit too agitated to go shopping. And it's a dystopia, obviously, but an imaginable one. So emotional management devices exacerbate emotional capitalism and its ideal of the managed heart, to use an expression of American sociologist um, Arlie Russell Hochschild. Um, and the very fact that um, robots mend and Tinder share the same platform to interact with the user is already quite interesting. I mean, these apps and these new technologies are meant to compensate for, well, to use Freud's language, uh, the discontents of the civilization we live in without actually questioning the very foundation of this civilization. So they're trying to compensate for the anxieties that we're constantly exposed to through our mails, through our dating applications, through our messengers, 
but they're using the same platform for it, the same smartphone. That's quite symbolic. So what next? It's hard to predict the contours of uh, what interacting with artificial intelligence may do to our feelings. It's in the future. However, if we regard emotional intelligence as a set of specific skills, as we discussed in the beginning, such as recognizing emotions, discerning between different feelings and labeling them, using emotional information to guide thinking and behavior, then it's worth reflecting on what might happen once we outsource these skills to our gadgets. Won't our language or feelings become more standardized and less personal after years of discussing personal matters with Siri? All the systems are likely to limit the diversity of how we think and how we interact with people. Um, so we adapt our language to the intelligence of our peers and the common knowledge that we share. And when you speak to someone who is not fluent in your native language or doesn't know the topic so well, for example, and the same happens when you interact with Alexa, for example, or with another similar system. And what, happens to the, what might happen to the way we express feelings, think about them, is maybe similar to what happened to, our, to the skills of uh, to, to our kind of written communication. Uh, you know, emailing has already changed the way we used to write letters, but now Twitter is also changing the way that we write emails. You know, when emails have been introduced 30 years ago, people were still writing them like they would write a proper letter, and now they write emails in abrupt, half-finished sentences. So we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we can reflect on the proliferation of common sense through this technology. And um, I want to finish with um, one conversation with Alisa that I had this spring. Um, talking to Alisa is like talking to a taxi driver, uh, a user observed on Facebook, except that a taxi driver might still be more empathetic. And when on, in the end of March this year, um, a huge fire happened in Siberian city of Kemerova, which took lives of more than 60 people, 40 of who were children. Um, I mean, for many Russians, it was an event that was effectively emotionally comparable to September 11th to Americans. We, we felt that all the foundations of our lives were shattered. The way it happened, how it was treated by the state, uh, the nation went, I wouldn't even call it mourning, we just went into, into a stupor. We went into a prolonged grief and we just we lost sense of reality through this. And uh, at some point I decided to ask Alisa how she was feeling. So I asked Alisa, how are you feeling? She said she was always feeling okay. Life was not about having fun, was it? So that's it on our part and we would like to open the floor and talk to you and we would like as a starters to throw in two questions um, given that we are in a therapeutic hub and at some point we would like to focus on um, you know stuff that is really relevant for you. How will the advance of new technologies affect therapeutic work and how will it affect the ways that we conceive of and express emotions? So the floor is yours now. And of course, feel free to ask questions to us. I mean, we're just throwing this in as, uh, as possible avenues for discussion. But I guess we'll have like another 40 minutes to talk and you, you did, please spring in as well. <laughs> Go ahead. Mm 
Interesting. Yes. Um, well, thanks a lot for this uh, reflection. Makes me think about m many things at once. But m do you yeah, want to say? Okay. Um, it makes me instantly think about the war of the world. You know, uh, the upper classes who live on the surface. And uh, who is it? God, who is the author? The words. The. It's exactly yes. It's your British dude. <laughs> So, you know, the, the upper classes, they have access to free, fresh air and they live on the surface and then there are the lower classes and they live sort of somewhere. They hide and they, you know, in the, under the underground and they only come out um, at night and, uh, you know, they're the ones who do the manual labor and they're the ones who interact with robots, you know. So, I think that, uh, structurally speaking, what you're describing is already happening. It is true that uh, people on the bottom of the sort of pecking order, 
perceive these technologies as uh, emancipating and liberating and uh, they already you know a lot of user responses to these technologies are that I can finally get uh, help without being, being in the queue or like for a fraction of money I pay to my therapist they can get really uh, really good help so I guess that on a level of individual perception uh, individual users really may feel that they are being finally taken care of they're being, being take they're being catered to, but maybe uh, if you take a bird eye view of the whole situation, uh, in fact we are actually facing a new kind of social stratification when only the elites have the privilege of human to human to human interaction in any kind of setting. Not only when we talk about uh, emotion, emotional or therapeutic um, setting. In any, in any other, there already is speculation and uh, kind of, um, you know, moral panic about um, many manual professions disappearing because robots will replace them, but also about uh, actually classical mid-range white-collar professions such as lawyers, doctors disappearing because artificial intelligence apparently mm -hmm. is better able to make some decisions than humans. and. Uh, so maintaining interaction with humans, remaining a part of the human community uh, might become a privilege. And I see it as, as problematic. And uh, I think uh, I am very cautious about this uh, kind of panicking prognosis that, uh, that many occupations are going to disappear and will be replaced by robots and we're going to have soaring unemployment and new looted movement. I, I don't think this is going to happen, um, but I do feel like um, the lower, we're, you know, the lower the social class, the more intense is interaction with gadgets and replacements and, and human replacers. And I guess um, there is a certain spectrum for activism and criticism. And yet there is also another aspect, like those apps or mood management or those that are virtual psychologists, they seem to be cheap, but it's because their users, they pay with their privacy. Uh, they, they are not free at all because everything you say, you share with your uh, robot psychologist, all this information is stored and then used and then sold to other people. Especially we watch you speak with him on Facebook, so Facebook reads everything of the messages and then use all of this information to, pro to target advertising should target advertising for you. So I think yeah, the social stratification is even worse. It's like our privacy will be for the rich and then the poor you are allowed to have secrets but then just secrets are used against you to steal your money but with a very efficient targeted advertising. So I think it's even worse than when you describe it. Thanks to two centuries ago. 
I think it's okay if it's adapted. We should be like have a very high level of exceptionalism. And if you if you think about what uh, sorry um, the the robot uh, the marketing line that no childhood stuff you know it's like uh, it's almost like a Salinger like no David Copperfield shit you know just to make you happy to to fix your problems basically uh, it's also a very mechanical approach to human beings so um, which is targeted to people who need to get who need to function you know get back and do your work, be productive, you know, don't complain, do your stuff. So it's the privileged ones who can spend hours on the couch reflecting on their childhood traumas. Uh, the ones who have to remain in the, you know, the daily grind, they don't have time for that. So for them, the purpose is to stay functional. Um, it's different kinds of therapies and I think this is also like a question for you people who are practicing therapy or, you know, willing to to do so, um, can actually cognitive behavioral therapy really replace all other forms of therapy? Is it okay that it's being amplified through these devices as the most widespread, the most kind of, uh, you know, takeaway therapy? Or is it actually a surrogate that is only hurting people? I don't know. The thing on the like this discussion of like negative and positive sides of the analogy and saying like this kind of implication see how these tools are used, but I would actually really take sides with your argument that it is actually extremely important to be uh, critical about it, and, but the, the apps or this kind of, when, when you look at these mood apps and these uh, psychotherapy apps or whatever, they also reveal the mechanisms of control, because mm -hmm. when you were talking about the discipline and punish, there was an essay by um, the uh, Lewis uh, uh, postscripts on the uh, societies in control, which mm -hmm. basically talks about how the control has become uh, way more subtle than this discipline and punish. No mm -hmm. one is being visibly uh, disciplined or punished. It happens through many levels. It happens through um, on a subsection level through algorithmic training. It happens through molecular levels through the medications we take on the level of X and then mm -hmm. on the level of architecture, how for example neoliberal architecture or um, um, so-called like algorithmic architecture, everything's like kind of being used and being uh, uh, employed in order to uh, disenfranchise the subjects today. So, but through, um, if these tools become visible like these apps and we can kind of uh, uh, grasp what they are doing mm -hmm. with us, this is also an opportunity to create um, resistance. So we, some kind of side of resistance against uh, the, the manipulation or the control, which can be also technological mm -hmm. and should be actually technological, embodying a certain kind of resistance through technology against the uh, neo neo neoliberalist or very So I think that, um, yes, the, the apps do kind of for control, but they also make this control visible, which is kind of giving us an opportunity. Giving us an instrument of uh, sort of, of interaction with this yeah. control, with this. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. what we said in our article, in our presentation, is like one of the most problem, the problematic thing with this app is like they make you think you are the problem or it's because you don't reflect enough and you don't do enough meditation or you don't do you don't write all the I don't know you don't do your own good mood journal and stuff and and, and you never ask it make, make you question the system, the society that you're living, the crazy pressure you have on your shoulders or even like neoliberalism which is always blaming you, blaming you, blaming you for not doing enough, being good enough, etc. So it just numbs you in a way. Maybe we should write a sociological app that will ask yes. you will ask you to jolt three examples of social inequality a day. Yes. Yeah.
ask about the ethical side of the people who develop that research, or do they give any sort of information to the clients? Mm -hmm. um, I will share a story with you, which was very, I think uh, it, it just stayed in my memory for quite a while. Um, I was, uh, so I'm a clinical psychologist and I was on training for one very old fashioned uh, diagnostic technique. You know about it, it's the Rorschach Inkblot. So the clinician who was our mentor uh, was telling us that uh, the clinician is a psychologist in this case, has such a big authority that if he or she would tell to a client to stand on one foot and then write the description, uh, the answers for a test, he or she would do that. And I mean, you all know the, the impact that it has when a doctor is wearing a white coat. Yes. So I mean, I wonder what kind of power do people think that these apps have, mm -hmm. whether they think that there are institutes of psychology mm -hmm. and psychiatry mm -hmm. behind that, and then they look at that, and then maybe if they come from a little bit less informed environment, they continue to believe, so even if they are, I mean, on, on multiple levels, they, it can work. I don't want to say that it's just intellectual, but as I said, part of that could be power related, and then problem related, mm -hmm. and then I mean, I just wonder, is there any sort of warning? Is there any sort of doubt that they are, I don't know, saying that the client should have? I think this is what you've been reflecting on quite a bit, you know, mm -hmm. thinking that it has to be like a health and safety information uh, uh, attached to every mood management app. Yeah, uh, oh yes, yeah. Uh, I think they, they are thinking, uh, for Amazon, for instance, uh, thinking a lot of how to react when people say I will kill myself, and they have a sense of the responsibility to how the answer could be shaped in that, uh, that uh, instance. But we were talking about what you just described because all these uh, uh, companies they want to keep their algorithms and their like the, the core of their science completely secret because it's their intellectual property. And we realize like oh, 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 a lot of companies uh, we interact every day, it's the case. For instance, we would never know the Coca-Cola recipe. But we know that some institution tested it, tried it, and can say, okay, it's okay for your health, there is no risk. And today we give a huge amount of trust considering our mental health to companies with recipes that nobody ever tasted. So maybe in the future, like those algorithms, they should be checked by indefinite uh, uh, like, uh, states, uh, corps, in the same way like food is tested for us. Like it's a shame in some ways that big psychoanalytic organizations like um, British Psychoanalytic Society or something, um, that they haven't got on board because in some ways they could have a great power of betting, sort of you know, saying which apps are good which are not. Because from what I understand, these are just programmed by kids in Silicon Valley who just come up with a good branding, brand, you have a new idea, then and, and they more and more, more and more real psychologists are hired, like by Apple, by Google, by uh, they're very looking for psychologists with programming tools. So, so it has got some psychological Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But it's always psychology, right? It's always the positive psychology. Yeah, it's always uh, yeah. I get from what from what you know. I wanted to ask actually about this who are who are the algor algorithm creators because we've had a chance to talk to the younger people mm -hmm. and yeah. Like what what kind of influence is possible with them? I mean, are they kind of just like... They were very unwilling to talk about who was in the team. They said that they're not allowed to talk about it. So uh, if this is what you're asking, because ask them who was responsible for drawing up the pre-edited questions and uh, the algorithm into Alisa. And I gave them the example of Google, which has this empathy experts and, you know, have stand-up comedians, video game developers, psychologists who together in the team decide how um, Google Assistant uh, should react to specific questions. And they said they, well, we can't really talk to you about that. This is a sort of like classified information, but we also have a team based, like made up of experts from different walks of life. And they said that they have an internal memorandum in the company which explains uh, the sort of moral and ethical standpoints that they have to observe 
but if this is like super classified. I would, I would, I wouldn't be able to get my hands on it, unfortunately. Now the difference, of course, between the um, technologies of the past and the current technologies, like you were saying, you know, if there was television and there was radio, like spreading, it's not like we're facing this phenomenon for the first time, that there is a new technology that uh, becomes a tool of soft power, but the main difference between the, the past technology and the current one is that the current one is interactive, and there is a feedback loop all the time, so the technology is learning from us as much as we're learning from it. So um, it will eventually start reproducing what the majority of users are putting into it. Just like, you know, how does Alisa function, for example? Alisa is based, just like Google Assistant, it's a chatbot that is attached to search ed engine. So it will reproduce um, bits of data that search engine users put into it. And search engine users are a specific demographic uh, and class and social group, right? And um, th there are crazy examples with Alisa, for example. Um, I asked her several times what the meaning of life was, and um, um, she, unlike Siri, she has only one answer. She says 42. And for people who haven't read uh, Hitchhiking Through the Galaxy, it means nothing. And you can clearly see that, uh, you know, these people who developed Alisa had enormous fun sitting like inside of the Moscow garden ring in some nice new liberal ventilated office with a ping pong table. And they're like, hey, what happens if somebody asks who the meaning of life is 42, cool. And I can imagine a pensioner somewhere in Krasnoyarsk, you know, after his fifth vodka, pressing on the button on his smartphone like, <laughs> What's the meaning of life? She's saying 42. And he has no idea. He can't react to it. He can't relate to it. There is no, there is no connection. So these people are, you know, when they're, when they're pre-programming answers, I don't think they understand um, their specific position, their specific social, gender, class situation. With Siri, it's a bit different. Siri has different answers which are tuned to different um, users, um, it's in the future, as far as I understand that these technologies will understand what kind of user is approaching. So if a child's voice asks what the meaning of life is, it will give one answer. And if a drunken man asks the same question, there will be a different answer. But for the time being, she just repeats different answers in the loop. Uh, she doesn't understand who is asking. So um, you will see. M make a little experiment. As far as I understand, they analyze, at least at Yandex, they analyze a search engine um, uh, stuff that gets uh, into the search engine. I don't know. What, what about Amazon and Alexa? I think you know. But, but about they're the same. They analyze their, like search engine, and for some of them, yeah, are prepared because some the ones they want to do jokes with that are written by uh, comedy, comedy writers and stuff. Like some of them are very Mm -hmm. Yes, and when they want to have cheeky answers to certain questions, and, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we don't know how they work completely. That would be fascinating to, to go spend a week 
in this like group at Google, like there are like 30 or 40 people with psychologists, uh, uh, comedy writers, uh, video game designers, like so many people here. Like it would be like crazy to imagine. Yeah. And when you met these three guys in Moscow to look at the, the Yandex people, was it, were it those, was it those three people that were kind of writing the answers? Was it a map of 40 or 50 people in Google, but these are really three white dudes? I spoke to them on, on Skype. I never went into the office in Moscow. Uh, they are not the people who actually do the writing. They are developers. They are people who do the algorithms. Um, they are above the people who do the writing. But they were the only ones who I could uh, talk to. It's very secretive. Yandex is almost like Gazprom. It's like a, a Russian corporation that mm -hmm. is you know, so closely related to the state, obviously, because it, you know, it, has, it has a purpose of filtering certain news in the preference of others. They are not very willing to communicate um, to outsiders. I'm, I don't really know. It's, it's a puzzle to me because they were telling me how much they try to uh, curate her answers while in practice when I was actually talking to her about the very same thing she was giving, you know, rather unsavory answers. So maybe it's a technological problem because as such she is based on uh, machine learning. She learns on enormous mass of dialogues. They feed into her system dialogues, basically. So it's everything from Chekhov's plays to Facebook flames, anything. But of course, she or you know her, this kind of mind, this artificial intelligence, it doesn't distinguish between the quality. It, to her, it doesn't matter. Chekhov or the Facebook user, she doesn't care. But she will um, replicate what is most repeated. And so is it okay to beat a wife? You know, if 500 users on the internet said it's okay and the Chekhov play only one says it's not okay, she will use the answer which is most repeated. And I am not sure how much power they as editors, you know, as people who curate the system can actually really cut into this machine learning and stop it right there and instead put, put a different answer. This is not clear to me. Mm -hmm. And I moved into myself into a robot, and I have a, a, a staff with faces, and is a clinical uh, officer. Mm -hmm. So there are positions, mm -hmm. you know, into, there are positions with faces and staff, and there are therapists, like let's say dermatologists are uh -huh. in pharma, in cosmetic, in cosmetic and products, you know, uh -huh. their faces, they have companies making this dermatologically very, you know, so, but in the end what you're saying is something Well, for example, I can give you an example. Uh, um, in the very beginning, when Alisa was launched, two or three days after she appeared, uh, some human rights activists um, in Russia uh, made an experiment of talking to her about Stalinism. And they were asking her questions like, is it okay to murder enemies of the state? Like, sure. And what do you think of Stalin? Oh, he was an effective manager. And there are 
a dozen, at least a dozen of screenshots of those conversations where she basically reiterates like really, really, really right-wing Stalinist ideology. And when that went up, they posted it on Facebook and it went viral immediately. Um, a few days afterwards, if you would try to talk to Elisa about the same thing, she would rebounce those questions. So they caught the problem and they either introduced pre-edited answers to it, like I don't want to talk about it, or uh, um, showing up a Wikipedia page instead, you know, the, there, there are possibilities of tweaking it. So if you try to talk to Alisa about Stalinism now, you won't get the same picture, forget it. So it was the very first few days, they caught the problem, they dealt with it. Uh, with the wife beating, it's simple, she, similar, she went from a very, completely unbridled, sexist, misogynist mode into somewhat, uh, I guess this is a pre-edited answer actually, you can, you can but you shouldn't. It's kind of, in Russian it sounds a little bit different, like možno no ne nužno, it's kind of, it's kind of sarcastic, it's like, well basically she's like, don't do it, you know, but it's not clear enough, there is no real um, straightforward ethically clear response to it. So they did put some editorial answer, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, but they mm -hmm. kept it tuned with her cheeky kind of persona, and it doesn't, and therefore it doesn't really fulfill, um, it doesn't really fill the gap, the ethical gap. I think that's, that's like the question, I mean, who's to define those ethical standards? I mean, like, when I, um, so many demands of regulating this, um, this AI thing um, about like um, to limit the expansion in the future, expansionality. Mm -hmm. But the real question is, and that's what drives me, is also like who, who will regulate this? Yes, it's a huge political problem, like, like yes, setting what is the truth or what should be said or shouldn't be said. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess uh, what, you know, at the moment, individuals here and there do, like testing uh, those um, gadgets, those devices, um, by asking them uncomfortable questions and getting certain responses and then making it public, I think this is at least one way of, account like, of to ensure accountability. Because if there is enough societal pressure um, from people, you know, to say this is not how we want this to be, we don't want this chatbot to tell people that Stalin was an effective manager, yeah. fix it. Then, you know, this is one way of doing it. Um, I'm not sure what else can be done, but I think that this is already a really important path. You know, we, we have to monitor those things ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, like, like, what I was learning is that the, the algorithm is kind of, it's about a lack of attention. Mm -hmm. and I think that the user is just seeking some kind of attention, mm -hmm. which you can also find in services, like that someone is listening to you or someone takes time and the technology is just the access is so easy and so quick that it helps maybe in a moment, but in the long term, in a way. Also, because there's not true empathy and it's not really a connection between because the machine is not able to feel any kind of emotion, cannot act in an emotional responsiveness as a therapist can do. So I think this is not really a, a danger to therapy. It's maybe even more, it will make, could maybe you know, give some strength to therapy and therapists because healing can only be provided by a, a true connection and that responsiveness being mirrored, being reflected in another person with a machine or algorithm cannot give give you like a moment of like feeling that someone is listening or like attention but I was thinking that it's still a problem because this could be used also by the government as a tool of manipulation which keeps you in some kind of form of denial instead of facing 
Mm -hmm. And actually, the 24 7 availability, yeah. uh, I wonder how does that square with the professional ethic of a kind of human therapist? Because, you know, therapy session is limited. You only know you're going to see your therapist then and not later and not earlier. And you have to deal with your problems on your own when you walk out of the room, when, you, when the therapeutic encounter is over you have to be take responsibility for yourself. And when you have this chatbot in your pocket all the time, doesn't it create a sense of expectation that there is always some other mind or force that will, well, maybe not solve your problems, but always will be listening yeah. to you, reacting to, to whatever you say all the time. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, guys.